Hello. Well, here we are again. It's lockdown two. Sadly, the need for a second lockdown closure was pretty obvious to most people except the government as the infection figures started coming through in early September. The return of schools and universities as well as continued back to work, back into work exhortations simply added to this. Mind you, for many towns in the north, special restrictions have never really been away. We'll come to why later. Needless to say, Bojo was in total denial about another lockdown, despite Sage telling him they believed it would be needed back in late September. Sage said that the October half term would be a good point for a two week, possibly three week fire break to halt the renewed spread of the COVID-19 virus without causing too much harm to schooling. Sage had also indicated that NHS test and trace was not sufficiently effective at controlling the pandemic. This is the system that was late, is underperforming badly, and not actually part of the NHS. It is in fact a privately run setup based on £12 billion of taxpayer funding to the usual associates of the Tory party, and run by Dido Harding. She is already known for a history of corporate failure. It's surely only coincidental that her husband is a Tory MP. World class has turned out to mean excruciatingly bad. This was another reason why a firebreak lockdown was needed, said the science. Keir Starmer made it clear Labour agreed and would back the government in such a move. The PM said such talk of tougher nationwide coronavirus restrictions was, quote, the height of absurdity. But Johnson and the Tory government make U-turns more frequently than an Uber driver trying to find his next passenger. Just ask footballer and school meals campaigner Marcus Rashford. Following some stern briefings on possible outcomes by Witty and Valance, England's chief medical officer and chief scientific advisor respectively, another partial nationwide lockdown took effect on the 6th of November. It is partial in that, for example, schools remain open and eateries can still run a takeaway service. Personal restrictions became significantly more onerous again, though at least unlimited outdoor exercise is actively encouraged. Speaking of U-turns, Chancellor Rishi Sunak was also obliged to announce the full resumption of the furlough payment system for those unable to work because of lockdown until the end of March. <clears throat> this was despite Sunak obstinately sticking to the ending date of the original scheme, October the 31st, when it was abundantly clear some weeks before that this was a bad move. People will have lost their jobs because of this, when a more flexible approach to the obvious uncertainty bearing down on us might have spared some pain. See this alongside the Tories' earlier utterly miserly approach to additional funding for northern cities forced into the then highest tier of restrictions. It seems clear that the Chancellor is no longer the golden boy next party leader that was being suggested four months ago. Indeed, Rishi's Dishes, his Eat Out to Help Out scheme, a report concludes, actually helped to spread the virus around more swiftly in August. Of course, the Tories deny this. Through the summer, a whole raft of studies were released that continually emphasised the structural inequality in the UK. Inequality which had led us to suffer the highest per head of population death toll in Europe. That mortality occurred disproportionately in poorer communities, communities already made more vulnerable by 10 years of austerity imposed by the Conservatives. Those funding cuts, it was revealed, were further disproportionately made in the poorer northern areas, reinforcing their difficulties when the virus began to take hold. Then see the response when Greater Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham had the temerity to stand up to the government. He demanded a sensible economic support package following the announcement that his city was to be placed into full Tier 3 preventative measures. This current government, 
run as it seems not by its elected members, but by a continuity vote leave campaign, typified by Dominic Cummings, hates, truly hates, any dissent regarding its policies. One gained the impression Manchester could have been consumed by the plague and still Johnson and his cronies would not lift a finger to offer further help. The nationwide lockdown imposed only two weeks later brought better financial assistance. So much for levelling up. Now, I don't know about you good viewers, but I think it's fair to say one is suffering from a degree of lockdown fatigue it's one thing to understand the perils of the virus, but another to be living through some fairly draconian restrictions on very ordinary things. When those restrictions were first put in place, eased probably too soon, scientific advice ignored, reality denied, and then lockdown reimposed by a government too obviously incompetent, it creates a level of tension that might cause problems. Whilst a majority of the people of the UK are trying to comply, unfortunately the death cultists are gaining ground. An unholy band of Tory backbenchers, crackpot wealthy sponsors, right-wing newspapers and that perpetual stain on the undergarments of Britain, Farage, claim that lockdown and restrictions are unnecessary and we should all take our chances as stout Britons. They offer scant evidence for this train of thought. In the same vein as Brexit, which shares much of its DNA and major players, it's all based on belief. For example, the virus is only like the flu, they claim. It isn't. Though this is still uncertain, the infection rate appears higher and the mortality rate may be as much as 30 times higher. At 3 to 4%, it's not Ebola but it's still not good against 0.1% for an, a flu. We should all go about a business and only make the vulnerable lockdown. Again, no, various academic papers have made it clear that the virus will still spread rapidly, overwhelming health services and putting everyone at risk again, let alone being very discriminatory towards already vulnerable people. Mask wearing infringes our human rights. No, let's just not do this. There is again evidence issued early on by the World Health Organization that mask wearing, if not protecting the wearer so much, reduces transmission quite well if the wearer is infected. This gains more traction when it appears likely that many people remain entirely asymptomatic but infectious. Mask wearing is actually about your responsibility to others, but that's hard for so-called libertarians to swallow. Libertarianism is, after all, just a grand name for selfishness. We should aim for herd immunity. Well, there are studies that suggest herd immunity from COVID-19 may not exist after all, and reinfection might occur quite quickly. And recall that mortality rate. It's not flu, remember. While so many things are uncertain, it seems safer and more humane to err on the side of caution. Of course, so many members of the death cult are rather insulated from others' coronavirus reality by their wealth, social status and occupations. They can quite easily afford to sit back and call for an end to restrictions, smugly secure in the knowledge that it's only poor people who have to put themselves in the firing line. This attitude one might perhaps call turd immunity. The instigators of these insidious untruths unfortunately do bring some of the gullible and conspiracy minded with them. Let's hope the lifeboat of an effective vaccine, which showed a topsail over the horizon last week, arrives to help us before many more months go by, or the cultists may drag us under again. Speaking of cults, the Brexiteer fantasists continue to drag the gullible and conspiracy minded with them towards the looming EU transition period cliff edge due on the 1st of January. Too many want us over and down to no deal crash out land, a ride this country will also surely regret. But that's a chat for next time. Oh, incidentally, as this script was being written, it seems Dominic Cummings has finally been given his marching orders from Downing Street. 
I don't expect any significant sanity, let alone empathy, to now gather around Johnson and his sycophantic cabinet. But with Lee Kane, another Leave campaign trooper gone too, perhaps just a little of the divisive poison that's infected Downing Street for some time has been squeezed out. Chin chin.